Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast with Rob Lewis, Jesse Simonton, Austin Price. I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us. Plenty to get to on this Tuesday installment of the podcast as Tennessee comes off a win against Mississippi State. Jeremy Pruitt learns last week to have orange pants, so he decides to wear them. But more importantly, guys, um, as you've had a couple days to digest it, give me the biggest offensive takeaway, biggest defensive takeaway that you have from Tennessee's win. Rob, I'll start with you. That's just line of scrimmage. I mean, both, both sides of the ball. I was, I mean, I, you know, Mississippi State's done me great defending the run. So, I mean, but Tennessee has been so poor, at least in their two SEC games, at running the football. I mean, they were, they were really consistent. And that, and that final drive of the game was just was the best, to, you know, considering the circumstances. You know, eight minutes left, or about three. I mean, that, that's the best I've seen the offensive line play since Jeremy's been here. And the other side of the ball, holding Hill to third, well, 11 yards rushing, seven sacks. I, I didn't think that you know, had it in him at all. I didn't think they had that kind of performance in him. I think we all agree line of scrimmage. For you in the line of scrimmage, Jesse, offensively, was it what they got out of Carvin? Was it the fact that Trey Smith looked like the freshman version of Trey Smith? Branding, I thought it was Brandon Ken- maybe Brandon Kennedy's best day or one of his best days as well in terms of moving people. Well, especially on that final drive. I mean, they ran behind Trey and, and Brandon on, on several of those runs. I mean, I, my takeaway, if we're talking just offense, uh, would be Trey Smith. I mean, he was even on plays that didn't, weren't necessarily successful because, as Jeremy you know, has alluded to, that sometimes it can be one guy messing up. Well, Trey was not that one guy. I mean, he, he was decleating. Uh, and really making mincemeat of a couple guys. My biggest takeaway just from the game itself is that, you know, we've been critical of the staff, and I think fairly so after the Georgia State uh, performance. Obviously, there was some issues, um, whether it was BYU, Florida, Georgia. This, they looked like one of the most expensive and, and best staffs in America on Saturday because they had a just very, very good game plan. And, you know, whatever Mississippi State was gonna do, Tennessee was ready for it. You know, even though the line of scrimmage they played better, it wasn't like they were just flying up the field and getting sacks that way. These were a lot of schematic sacks where guys in the back end were covering guys better. And on the front end, they designed and confused Mississippi State with a bunch of blitzes and pressures that, you know, we said it on the, at, right after the, the post game pod AP, they had three tackles for loss in five plays. And, and, and I just thought, you know, the game plan that they put together on both sides of the ball was just really sound and, and something that you know, potentially could be a positive moving forward if the guys are going to be able to continue to kind of translate that plan from the practice field to, to Saturday. Well, Jeremy talked about it, you know, today or uh, Monday about the fact that, you know, is a little bit of game plan, but also a little bit of just development as kids are getting more and more experience, um, you know, got, in them, got, up, got up in them a little bit more in the secondary. Um, you know, I know Nigel, uh, you know, kind of talked about, you know, his thought process the last few weeks, but he has played like a different kid the last two games and, uh, you know, has shown good ball skills and, you know, a couple other times actually probably could have picked off two more passes the last two weeks if he just decides to go try to catch the football instead of just trying to bat it down. So um, I, I think it was a common, you know, much like Coach Pruitt said, a combination of both is these guys get more experience. Um, I, I mean, it, I think it's hard to remember the fact that, you know, guys like Darrell Middleton, you know, haven't really ever played defensive line or had a true defensive line coach until this year. I mean, at least that, that that's how I feel about it. So, I mean, I think these guys are going to only get better. They're not world beaters, but, you know, Saturday shows that on any given Saturday, given a good game plan, they can compete. Well, they, they can if they execute the game plan, and they did execute. They didn't have nearly as many busts. They kept it clean. Uh, for me, I, I, maybe my biggest takeaway was the fact that Jim Chaney – played to what he had that game, okay? Because the second half game plan was not the game plan he had going into the game when Maurer got hurt. Uh, you know, Georgia State, they were going to be, hey, this we're going to do what we do, and we're going to check, and we're going to be all this exotics, and, and we're going to go you know, do all these crazy things or whatever and just, you know, wing the ball all over the place and do that stuff. And, and I, I think it's taken him several weeks to kind of adjust to the identity that he has to work with. I thought in the second half, it was as good as he's called plays, even though it was conservative, because he had a lead. They played with a lead with the understanding that, hey, this is going to be a low-scoring game, and, and got out of their own way instead of saying, let's do what we do. Let's do what you can do. 
And what you can do is we're going to ask Jared to throw it a couple times, not a whole lot. We're going to trust that we can run behind Trey Smith. Okay, they didn't they didn't line up and run it right a whole bunch. They ran right behind their best player and just kind of kept it simple and played to their strengths. And I don't know that through the first five or six games you could say this staff played to this, to this team's strengths. They played more to their system and what they wanted to do as opposed to what they could do, at least in my opinion. So that that was kind of that's kind of my biggest takeaway. Uh, after reviewing it, is I really like what Cheney adjusted to in the second half, given the fact that he was handcuffed with, with what all he what all he felt like he could do, and he played that way. And part of that was, you know, he played to the fact that the defense, uh, or that Mississippi State was was kind of climb, going uphill, anyways. That you know that the way sure. they were playing, that it was could Mississippi State score more than one, you know, two touchdowns against Tennessee's defense the way they were playing? Perhaps if Schrader had played the whole game, but the fact that he had basically just – Cheney just had to figure out how to, how, to, how to bleed 30 minutes. And obviously the offense wasn't going to be on the field for the, that whole time, but that's what he, he did. And, he, I mean, the 91-yard the, the drive, I mean, I had in the review piece, there was three runs in a row on that drive that are probably as good as any three runs Tennessee's had since Pruitt got here, just in terms of guys getting a hat on a hat. The tailback's hitting the right hole. The receiver's actually blocking on the perimeter. Uh, and, and that's a positive sign. And now we'll see if they can start doing it, you know, against the South Carolinas and the Kentuckys and the M- Missouris, you know, the back half of the schedule. I mean, Robbie played for a 22-yard field goal in the third quarter. I mean, he played for the field goal. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't play for a touchdown well, there because he was in a long-yarded situation. <clears throat> he didn't want to take a chance. 13-3, to three, a two-score lead he felt like was enough for them to win the football game, and ultimately it was, and he played it that way. I think the only pass that, <coughs> that Jarrett had beyond the line of scrimmage was the, the deep ball, which was a perfect pass, but was the deep ball to, to Keaton. He had one more that, that Jennings didn't catch. It went through his hands. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He threw the ball yeah. vertical twice. Which, well, wasn't he, a, which wasn't a bad throw. No, but it was the, both of them were the only person yeah. who was going to catch it was Tennessee. Right. And he played, you know, and I think part of that was because Jared was coming in cold, but he ran, ran the ball three times right before halftime. You know, when you, for points, yeah. I mean, yeah. just now I do quibble a little bit with that, and I put that in that. That's a that's a results first process deal, though. That I, if I'm Tennessee, I would I think looking back on that, there's a way to be conservative and not settle for a field goal that's 50 yards. If if Ty if Chandler missed, if Ty Chandler doesn't slip, he might hit his head on the goalpost on the cutback because the middle of the field's open. He slipped and fell there. He's at least going to get ten more yards and make that an easy. But I, field I mean, goal. I think if, I really think that was more about Jarrett coming in, you know, for for his first series. And they the had pitch. they had butchered the end of the first half of essentially every game they played this year. But you're right. I mean, you flirted with almost not getting the field goal because you barely made the field goal. There. Right. Because I mean, again, you saw it all across college football. You know, settling. For, you know, none of those field goals are given. And and so I I am curious if they maybe. You know, figure. Hey, there's some other conservative plays that we can, you know, perhaps get five, seven yards instead of two and three. Because they did ultimately. They, he made the 50-yard kick, but that was a that was a tough kick. Yeah, it was di- it was dicey, and they were extremely conservative uh, on, at that point because Jared was cold, and I don't think they wanted to take a chance on turning the ball. I mean, they had just they've been bad at the end of the half. Right. Um, they they really have been. They, they have struggled mightily there. Let's go back to the offensive line for a second, because I think this is kind of an interesting situation. Might not be a factor for this week, but I think it's creeping in in the next couple of weeks. Jameer Johnson's going to be back healthy. He's close to being healthy now. Maybe not this week. Maybe it's the South Carolina week. Riley Locklear is going to be back and is healthy. Trey Smith's playing his best ball at left guard. There's a thought among the staff that their best five would be Trey Smith at right guard, Jameer Johnson at left guard, with Wanye at left tackle, Darnell Wright, Brandon Kennedy. Do you even think about moving Trey Smith, flipping sides with him, given what you saw out of him against Mississippi State? How do you think they're going to play that moving forward with all the offensive line combinations that they've been playing Well, you're, you're sure more likely to do that than you are to put try to even go down the road of playing Jameer at right guard. No, but the, the question is, does Jameer get on the field if you think he's one of his best? The, the only way he can get on the field is play the left side. Yeah. So he's got to play left guard. Do you, to quote, get your five most physical guys there, do you mess with the chemistry that clearly Wanye Morris and Trey Smith are developing, as Wanye talked about when he met the media this week, how comfortable he is beside Trey? Do you mess with that? I personally probably don't. I mean, I, I mean, I just, I mean, maybe I don't have a, a full appreciation for Jameer Johnson, but I mean, is he that much better than Raleigh Locklear or 
or you know even Jerome Carvin. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I I, I just man, I mean, when you finally have found a little success, I don't know that I would be tampering with it. I tend to lean I tend to lean towards Rob because I think Wanye is getting better, and I think part of the reason why Wanye is improving is because he's got a little security blanket to his right. And trade. they are still rotating at right tackle. I mean, right. Darnell's getting two-thirds of the reps, but Calvert's still getting, you know, he's getting that other third. They're basically every third series, Calvert's kind of going in. Uh, I think he played 15 snaps on Saturday. Uh, Darnell played the rest. And then, you know, Pruitt saying on Monday that they thought about, you know, suddenly Jerome Carvin looked like he was fourth string, which makes sense if they were thinking about redshirting him in hindsight which Pruitt said uh, or discussed the possibility of on Monday, suddenly he comes in and, and, you know, he and Ryan Johnson kind of share those duties at right guard. I think we're in agreement that if, if there's a pecking order right now, it would certainly seem to be Locklear, Calvert, you know, or Carvin, excuse me, Johnson, uh, you know, in that order. But is that better than, like Rob said, flipping Trey over and putting Jameer in. It's how much better is Jameer than those three guys, I guess? Yeah, I, I just think that's an interesting dynamic because I do believe that they felt like their best five if, if they could have got them all like, healthy. If you feel like Trey does not take a step back, because he is starting to find a groove. Oh, he, and, and, you know, I think I think Saturday was as well as he's played in a Tennessee uniform. Yeah, cause he, and so, he was not great against Georgia and Florida, but sat, Saturday he was phenomenal. So, yeah. so you know, so and he earned he, SEC lineman of the week. So if he if if you don't feel like he's going to take a step back, then I would make the move because I do think Jameer's got a certain nastiness to him. But if you feel like Trey's going to take any step back at all, I, would but, I mean I think that's what it's all about. Yeah. Just, and I per, you know I just don't know how how tough it is to make that move personally. I mean I'm you know on just sitting here talking. Did he about not, it, as a think, freshman? Did he not play right guard? He did. Some? He did. Yeah, he, he played right the whole, the whole, the whole time. year. Yeah. yeah, the whole year. But that's two years ago when. Two rounds of blood clots and a year of not practicing, you know, since that since that's taken place. So, I don't think it's going to be an issue this week because I, I don't know that Jameer plays this week. If he does, I think he'll play some at left guard, spell and Trey a little bit in, in this game. Uh, but moving forward with some more winnable games down the stretch, I think it's going to be interesting to see I, what happens. I, I'd love to know what Jameer Johnson weighs right now. He looks like a tight end. No, no. I, I, I'm going the opposite way. I think this – two, three weeks off he's had, they've just been throwing food in his face. He looks like he's gotten a little bit borderline fat. I mean, he looks a lot bigger than he did. Uh, to me, he doesn't. See, I watched him out there in a skin-tight shirt on Saturday in warm-ups. You're in the box. I, I mean, fine. I mean, I put binoculars on him. He doesn't look like he weighs close to 300 no, pounds no, 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 or 280 but, pounds. See, I think he does look over 280. See, I, I don't. I think he looks like 270 at best, 265. I don't think he's that much bigger than he was, personally. But, again, that, that's – that's an interesting potential decision they have to make moving forward because here's a program that for the last four or five years has struggled to find five, struggled to keep five healthy. If they can get through this week healthy, then they may have some interesting decisions to make because they've got some competition, middle of the year, you know, and, and decisions on who their best five and what their best five combination is, which is something they've not had to deal with for, for a long period of time. Uh, or for it's certainly been a while since they have been able to do that. How does tennis over to the defensive side? How quickly can you crash course crouch? I know we practiced some there last week. C clearly, he can go find the ball in the run game. Clearly, all their inside linebackers struggle with pass coverage. He really struggled with pass coverage, I thought, in the game, Jesse. And Alabama loves to cross, they love to cross people up in the middle of the field. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think – they, Tennessee doesn't have an answer there because Jer, Jer, Jeremy can throw out J.J. Peterson and, and, you know, Aaron Beasley and even talked about Solon Page. Page was the only guy they put on the field out of those three on Saturday in terms of defensive snaps. And, and it was at the end of the game when they were still trying to get a stop to, to make sure that uh, Mississippi State couldn't score and get an onside kick or anything like that. So they clearly don't trust J.J. yet. I think Crouch is going to play a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised if – you know, one, one of the interesting schematic things that Tennessee did Saturday against State um, to try to limit their RPO stuff was they went to that Rabbits dime package way more than they have all season. I, I had it in the notes. I had it I have in the PFF piece. Blakely played 13 snaps total against BYU, Florida, and Georgia. So three Power Five, you know, independent major teams. 
13 snaps, and he only plays in that dime package as that nose guard, you know, nose tackle up front. They ran that package 14 times against Mississippi State. Now, in various fronts, but in various looks, and I wonder, because that is a way that <laughs> technically Toa Toa has to be the only quote-unquote inside linebacker because then you're just throwing out four edge rushers that are kind of lined up all over where they had, they would put Kayvon Bennett, Daryl Taylor, Crouch, and, and sometimes DeAndre Johnson all out there together. Um, so I wonder if that's a potential uh, avenue that they, they explore early in the first half. You know, Pruitt said they got to find one thing to stop. No one else has figured that out against Alabama, so perhaps he will because he might know that personnel a little bit better, but I'd be surprised. It's going to be a tough day for Tennessee's defense. Yeah, I don't think – I mean, just looking at what Alabama does is, is – it's, it's the best core of receivers I can ever remember seeing – um, in terms of their ability to make plays vertically, catch it, make everybody miss, you know. And then you've got to, to me, they're so much better. To me, they're better than Ike and Redell and Jacquez Green. Oh, I don't think it's close because Ike and Redell were vertical guys only, in my opinion. These guys, you can throw it on a, you can throw them a two-yard pass, and it may go 65 yards to the house. Or and Pruitt even talked about day. that. You know, they made they. they or Alabama will go some max protection deep shots where it's like one and two routes, but a lot of their stuff may be empty formations where two only throws the ball six yards, but Waddle and Judy take it 65. And, I mean, they did that against Texas A&M on Saturday. Yeah, they made a living against it against Ole Miss when they scored 21 points before you could go get a soda or, or a cold beverage out of, the, out of the refrigerator. They're impressive. Yeah, and, and, then, and you've got the number one pick in the draft throwing the football to them. I mean, it's it's it's. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to pump them up. You know, I don't want to upset. You, know, you don't have, you don't have to pump them up. Every, but, everybody knows but, exactly just, what. But, you, I mean, what you I, it's as good of a passing attack as I've seen in the SEC. I mean, so, I so can Tennessee? And we'll talk more about the, the, you know this game and stuff on Friday. But Tennessee's got it's it's Tuesday. Tennessee's carrying momentum for the weekend. Okay, I'm not talking about recruiting momentum. I'm talking about momentum within the program. Guys feel like they're getting better. You know, you've got some guys who are making improvements. Nigel Warriors playing the best he's played of his career. Alante Taylor played well. Daryl Taylor he, had his breakout. Yeah, I mean, game. you can Trey go Smith, on and on yeah. about guys who played well. How do you how do you not lose that going into this game where you're a 35 point underdog? How how do you carry some momentum through the weekend to get yourself back ready to play against South Carolina? What what what's what's I guess maybe what's success for Tennessee? What, what do you got to do to not lose this momentum? Is it simply not give up 100 points or 70 points? I mean, what is it that you just can flush this game on Saturday and move on? I think it's going to the game. I, mean, I know you coaches say, well, we go into every game we want to win. I think it's just going into the game knowing that Alabama is Alabama. They've done this to Bukua teams over the years. So, you, you know, they're going to make plays. You know, if you go in there thinking that you're going to have some you, – if you go in there thinking, oh, South Carolina beat Georgia and Athens, we got a shot. I mean, I think you have to have some tip semblance of a mentality like that. But you also have to know that, you know, I mean, they're putting up PlayStation-type numbers. So, I think it's just, you know, understanding that, you know, just because Alabama may score some points Saturday, and they're going to, um, doesn't mean that Tennessee's went back in the tank defensively. Or if you know, I, I, I'm a Jesse on this. I think that you know Tennessee's going to score some points just because Alabama's not great on defense this year. But to me, like Alabama's still got some dudes, so you, you still got to have to make some plays. I think offensively, you want to put points on the board because if you if you go out there and you score three or ten, then you know to me they did take a step back because they ought to be able to get you know a, a couple of touchdowns against this defense because you with, with as much as Alabama scores, you're going to get more offensive opportunities. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm kind of of the opinion that, you know, you almost treat this how Ole Miss did, where you, you can't be afraid to get into a shootout. And Ole Miss still got – they still gave up 60 or whatever it was. But they walked away from that game being like, oh, this little Plumley kid, he can play. He, you know, he almost scored 30 points on Alabama. And, you know, it wasn't like it was garbage. I mean, they were, they were moving the football. Um, so I do think that's maybe, maybe kind of the, the mindset of this week, that, you know, you, you, but you're not going to shut down – Judy and why and why and we didn't even mention you know the, the tail I mean Najee Harris is playing well now I mean he had a big, huge game on Saturday so find some ways to kind of get on the scoreboard and and you know see if you can you know whether it's making them sweat or just give your guys you know some confidence going into this you know latter half of the schedule where the rest of the teams that you do face are, are much more on your caliber caliber excuse me 
Yeah, I just think that's, I think you have to look at it that way. Look, try to make them sweat, push it as hard as, you know, push them if you can push them with the understanding they're going to make some plays. You make some plays and hope, Rob, that it's a really, that they have a really bad day and they turn it over and, you know, do some crazy things in the game because you just don't have the horses in the stable to run with them right now. And I think everybody in the country knows that. And I think everybody in this fan base knows that. I agree. And they may get a, I mean, some of these fans, some Tennessee fans will get a funny feeling by Thursday or Friday. But, you know, they, in the back of their mind, they're, they're, they know that they're, you know, they're taking a, a knife into a gunfight. And, and, you know, and I think that, that begs the question to me, and it doesn't sound like it based on the way Jeremy was talking today, but I would almost not play Brian Bauer. I would, I would hide behind the concussion protocol. And, I mean, you got a bunch of games coming up that you can win. It's still, you know, it's a slim hope. I mean, you can still make a bowl game. I would, I might keep him on the shelf this week. But again, it didn't. Well, it didn't. It didn't sound like that was the direction Jeremy was going in, based off his comments on Monday. I mean, I think the bowl game comes down to next week, and and, and, for, and that's what Rob's saying is you got to think big picture here. You know, if you beat South Carolina, then you legit have a chance to win three out of the four. Sure. In November. I mean, Kentucky's bad, and I mean, Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt is this terrible. may be the Vanderbilt worst Vanderbilt team in, in years. I mean, they're, they're bad, and, and then of course UAB. So I mean, you know, if you can win next week, which to me is kind of the benchmark game, because the, the thought of going zero and two these next two, and then going four and zero is is very far fetched. Yeah, I just think you're still trying to establish your culture of competing, competing all the time. I, I I'll question that message if everybody on the team knows that Mauer's okay. He's you know he's got his wits about him. What kind of message are you sending to a young team to everybody? Hey, we compete. We don't back down to anybody. We don't do any of this stuff. We're going to go out there and compete. You know what's and that's why I think Brian Mauer is going to play. Now I would bring I would bring second base out to the practice field for the next three days. And while he was in concussion <laughs> protocol, he would probably slide into second base a couple of hundred times because he you know you got to under he's got to learn and they've got to teach him to learn. The risk of two extra yards versus protecting yourself Missing and two giving games. up, yeah, and giving up two yards. You know, look if it's if it's fourth and if it's fourth and one, fourth and three, you got to get to the sticks. But if you're just trying to get two extra yards to get two extra yards, you got to learn to get down. As much as the fans rally and love, oh, he's tough. He's this, you got to get down because you can't get yourself hurt the way he did on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, he got his ribs destroyed at the end of the game against Georgia, and he got his, you know, he got helicoptered against Mississippi State. So he's I mean, he's gonna be feeling it. I mean, yeah. I, I I'm with you though. I think if if he's good to play, because of of kind of the the physical physicality and toughness message that the staff is preaching, it would be a a harder sell. Now maybe you split time. Maybe you let him and Jarrett play. Maybe it, you get him out early if it's ugly. Okay. I mean, I get all of that. I mean. It's also like it's also. I mean, let's like it's is Mauer. I mean, like he threw. He was not that great on Saturday either. I mean, the idea that you know Tennessee knows that he's definitely the guy. I think to me, they're not going to go back to Jarrett. But I mean, not like Mauer's Mauer's done more. Mauer's done more interceptions per pass, you know, than the guy that every Tennessee fan was looking to, you know, ship out of town. Yeah, but the guy that everybody wanted shipped out of town, which they booed on Saturday, the coaching staff didn't want him throwing. Didn't want. Oh, hundred percent. There's clearly no. Con- I, I don't disagree. I just think it's funny that you know, kind of interesting that the way things have kind of played out. I mean, Mauer made two very bad freshman agreed. throws. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Jeremy clearly, I mean, he said it on the coaches show, said it afterwards, you know, there was two other plays that he just blatantly missed. Um, it's, it's just, it's interesting. It's not like, it's not like he's, no, you disagree, Rob? No, I was going to say this. I'm going to give him a pass on the second interception because, I mean, I don't think it's. Thank you. That's, I, 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 I said that on the podcast. The, I mean, like, the, I, who, the first, the first one was terrible. He threw it into double cup. I mean, you just can't make that throw in the red zone. But the second one, I mean, would, with the information we have now, I mean, who knows what the kid will see. I mean, it still counts. It, it still goes down as an interception and a bad decision. But, you know. Well, some, who's, who, uh, so Jeremy doesn't want it. Jeremy thinks the concussion protocol is fine. But, so then Maurer is allowed to play four plays and throws a pick. I mean, someone's got to be culpable. <laughs> well, I mean, he clearly didn't bust the three previous play calls in the huddle. So he, he had some semblance of knowing what he was doing. I mean, it wasn't like he was... It wasn't the next play. He didn't have to spend the second half in a dark room. I'm not saying it wasn't a concussion, because it was. But he was it, jumping up in the stands but it was, the pants. It, it wasn't the worst. Bottom line is, you don't throw back across your body, off balance, into the end zone, and give up points. And I think that's the point Jeremy Pruitt was making. Maybe he, maybe he was not of sound mind there, 
Um, but clearly everybody thought he was for, for the play call that was made there. And you just, he's got to take care of the football better, period. And, and, and I think that that's, he's got to take care of himself and he's got to take care of the football better to make the, because we all want to know what's his next growth. You know, what, what's the next step in his progression as a player? And I don't think it, it, it's certainly not toughness. We all know that that's there. It's not playmate. I mean, he's not afraid to run it, okay? He's got a quick release. He squeezes the ball into windows. His next progression is management. He's got to be, he's got to start to grow up in terms of managing the game, understanding the risk versus the reward and all that type and of stuff. And I will say this, this is a very underrated play, but I think the biggest difference between him and JG outside of them both throwing it to the other team as much as they have this season, this, it ended up being the interception that he had in the first play to Jawan, but that drive, he bobbles the snap. It's a little high. Mauer is athletic enough to right. turn. That was a play that if JG was back there or some or even Shrout, that's a sack or a loss, and Mauer turned that into a five-yard gain. And that right now is kind of the difference with, between those two and what the, the dynamic that he does present, just kind of so it doesn't sound like I'm totally dumping on him there. I mean, that, that, that he does he, – his, his athletic ability is, a, is, an, is an avenue this offense needs to take advantage of being that he, if he can learn to slide or can kind of avoid some big hits. Right, and nobody questions that he throws the ball better and that he's a better athlete. That's not even up for debate by anybody. All right, let's jump into recruiting right quick. Um, had a couple of guys here that had Oxendine in on the official visit. Austin, you had a chance to visit with him. Uh, they got the, the 21 quarterback, uh, Villeneuve. Christian, Christian Villou. Villou. Yeah. Got him back down here. He camped here this summer. That was a big get. How much momentum does Tennessee gain from first half of Georgia and then coming back the next week and beating Mississippi State with, with all recruits? And then you can specifically talk about Oxendine if you want. I mean, I think it was good to see for all those guys, whether it be Tyler Barron, Jay Hardy, uh, Harrison Bailey. You know, any of those guys that you know, either Tennessee's trying to hold on to or they're trying to reel in, um, more so with those guys than even a guy like Oxendine. Um, you know, to me, uh, to get the win, play the way you played, in front of those defensive linemen, and this includes Oxendine getting seven sacks, um, you know, just getting after it on defense. And, uh, you know, I, I think Tennessee is, you know, weathered a little bit of a storm here in recruiting um, now the question is is can they you know continue to weather it and win some more football games um, but you know I, I, the message is pretty simple in state you know they're going to try to bring in all those kids we've talked about um, you know it seems like they survived the weekend with Chris Morris um, we'll see more going forward I'll talk to more people this week about kind of where uh, where that thing stands out there um, and then of course I, I don't know if Texas A&M is as big of a factor with Big O as they were with Chris Morris. So, um, you know, I, I'm interested to kind of see how all that plays out. But guys like Hardy and Barron, I thought Saturday was huge. We hear this in basketball a lot about player development, how big that is. How important is it that Jeremy Pruitt and his staff can sell to Big O, can sell to Hardy and Barron? Look how much better this guy is week six than he was week one based on stat numbers or just on watching tape of them. How, how big of a deal is that? Is that to sell versus just wins and losses? Because we talk a lot, everybody talks a lot about wins and losses. You got to win, you got to win, and, and, and you do. But how much of it can you benefit in recruiting by selling these guys on look how much better this guy's getting or that guy's See, getting? See, I think it kind of goes hand in hand. I mean, like look at Rick's basketball team. They won some games, obviously. But when he could start pitching the development of Kevin Punter and the development of this guy or that guy that were just two- and three-star guys, and all of a sudden they're a Sweet 16-type team, all of a sudden, you know, the Josiah James and the Jaden Springers and those kind of guys all of a sudden are, you know, much more prevalent, you know, they talked about in Tennessee's recruiting. I, I think, so you so I, have I think you've got to win, but I think that, 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 that part of the win, though, is to be able to say, hey, it kind of because if, if you develop guys, the more likely you're going to win. So, you know, I think it, it, it does help. There's no doubt that being able to say, hey, look, look what he did in these first two games. Now, since then, he's had this amount of tackles, that amount of tackles, or this amount of catches, that amount of catches, whatever, beside the ball, whatever position you're pitching. Um, I do think the development thing is huge. Um, just because kids, some... kids do want to get developed. I mean, they want, it, they want to take, you know, say, okay, I know I've got talent, but I can be better. Who can get the most out of me? Well, and that's been a pitch that Jeremy Pruitt's made since he's been here. He's been, he's been very clear with guys setting them down, and whether it's in the summertime or on a visit or wherever, saying, "Hey, here's your deficiencies. 
He's, he's, he's had no problem showing guys areas where he thinks that they've got to get better um, and, and moving forward. Four o'clock start for South Carolina. Good for recruiting, bad for recruiting, okay. No so, big deal. I, I don't think it hurts. I mean, it gives teams. Better than get, noon? Yeah, I mean, it gives everybody a chance to get here. Um, you know, that noon game was going to be, you know, if it, would, if it had been noon, that, you know, getting Big O here for his official visit was going to be a thrill a minute because there is no direct flight from Memphis to Knoxville. So you've got to leave early out of Memphis, go to Atlanta or Charlotte, and then into Knoxville from there. Um, so I do think that 4 o'clock helps uh, dramatically. Okay. How in the world is there not a direct flight from Knoxville to Memphis? That's the craziest thing in the world. All right, let's jump to basketball right quick, Rob. Uh, Rick Barnes keeps bringing people in. Uh, <laughs> he's, you know, where everybody's waiting on Jaden Springer, P.J. Hall's coming in, uh, and then they're bringing in, they bring in Caldwell this past weekend. Springer's obviously got a spot, Tennessee, and, and you continue to feel like they're in a great spot with him. You made an interesting post on the message board, I thought, and it wasn't a suddenly, suddenly P.J. Hall's not a good player type deal, but it is how does Caldwell fit into what Rick wants to do versus Hall? How do they, you know, how do they manage? Are they going to wait on Hall? Regardless, you I mean, think? I don't, I don't think they're going to wait forever, but I also think they're in a good spot where I, I mean, I think Cardwell is willing to wait for Tennessee. And he's visited Georgia, Miami, Vanderbilt, and he's got a UConn trip coming up. And I mean, I think he would, you know, he didn't come out and tell me this yesterday, but I, I think he would like to come to Tennessee. So I think he's willing to let things play out. And um, whereas PJ is not a slam dunk by any stretch of the imagination, I mean, Clemson is pulling out all the stops to, you know. Lots of love. Lot, and, you know, in-state, he, he's, you know, an hour or so away from campus. I mean, they're, they're, they're playing the in-state card hard. And that, you know, that's not, and that's not a bad program. I mean, they're not gonna, you know, ever be, be better than North Carolina or Duke, but they, they have been an NCAA tournament team under Brownell. So, and Virginia Tech, I think, really went, went hard this weekend. He was, he was up there on an official visit and, you know, his dad played for Mike Young at, when, when Young was an assistant coach at Wofford. Young's known the family for a long time. So, I mean, I, if you're Tennessee, I don't think you're running the risk of losing Cardwell is what I'm saying, just because you're waiting to see what P.J. Hall is going to do, who is a far less certain proposition. Now, I, but, I, you know, I kind of wonder if, as I posted, if Cardwell wouldn't be a better fit because Hall's, I mean, Hall's a better player, but he's mo that's mostly because he's much more skilled offensively. 6'9", I can shoot it, whereas Dylan is, you know, 6'11", 7' foot, and not really polished offensively, but plays hard, rebounds, defends. But, you know, here's the other thing. You might, I mean, P.J. Hall's probably a four-year player, and if you're, if you're reading anything that's coming out of the USA Basketball event Colorado Springs this weekend, Keon Johnson is probably a one-year player now after this weekend. I mean, he blew people away. I mean, he's, NBA, NBA scouts could attend the event. Um, I talked with Eric Bossy yesterday. He told me that he thought Keon was one of the best three players there, and he had tons of NBA scouts coming up and talking to him about him. Like, based off just th what happened this weekend, I mean, the, he, these things change a lot, but that, the Keon Johnson, I saw a mock draft last night that was taking into account what happened in Colorado Springs this weekend. Keon was number 17. I mean, so, I mean, I think Springer is, pro you know, Springer probably thinks he's one and done. I don't know, we'll have to see. I mean, Josiah James, I'll be stunned if he's here more than two years. So the cause of that, maybe that changes Rick's thinking on, I guess what I'm saying, in taking P.J. Hall, who is probably, I mean, he's a Luke May top four-year player, I think, in Carolina. So I don't, I mean, it's a good problem to have if you're Tennessee. But yeah, if Disney get Luke May, that's a heck of a deal right there. I mean, but I'm talking about the, I think the, the, the way Keon Johnson is being perceived is, I mean, he's he could very easily end up being ranked higher this year in this class. I mean, yeah, because once he got the foot healthy, he's <coughs> he's gone he's gone pretty bananas at every camp he's been. And, Col the Colorado Springs deal back yeah, several months both, ago, and, and both of well. those are big time. You yeah. know, at, at it take, they take place at the national team's Olympic training facility. I mean, and the the fact that NBA scouts are in that gym watching these kids. I mean, that that. I guess what I'm saying is like the things that, that people that I talk to, like Eric Bossy and others, they're talking to NBA scouts. I mean, this, is, this isn't just something they're coming up with on their own. I mean, they're, right. they're talking to, to people. And a lot of, I mean, if you, if you watch the NBA, it's, it's, I know Jesse is big on it. It's the, it's the two-way wings, man, that, you know, like Paul George, and, and, that, and that's the kind of things that, that people, th those are the kind of comparisons you're hearing about Keon now. All right, so maybe Tennessee has a better, they should have a better feel with where they are with PJ after this weekend, can maybe make some decisions. Oh, I think he'll court. decide pretty quickly. Yeah. So we'll see what happens after that visit there. Quickly on the current team, 
had a chance to you had a chance to visit with them. You have more stuff coming out throughout the week uh, at Media Day. Had a chance to see these guys work a little bit. What's your early takeaway? Uh, and I know Josiah James has been banged up. They got a couple guys out with injury right now. What's your biggest takeaway from this uh, team? Lamonte playing really well. They really need Plastic. Really, 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 need, really, 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 really need Plastic to to be eligible. Uh, the longer that lingers, the more. I mean, I, I think Tennessee can be, is going to be a fun team to watch. I think they can be an NCAA tournament team without Plasic. And I, and again, I've said this before. I'm pumping the brake. He's not an all-world guy, but he's unlike anybody else they have on the team in terms of size, in terms of clogging the lane. And uh, I, I really, if they have him, I think they're one of the top three or four teams in the SEC. If not, I think they're a, you know, a, and they'll, they'll get into the tournament, but I don't think they're going to be pushing, you know, for a league championship. All right, plenty of basketball coverage coming up throughout the week. Obviously, plenty of football coverage as well to get you ready for Tennessee and Alabama. That's going to do it for this edition of the VolQuest.com podcast. For Rob Lewis, Jesse Simonton, and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great Tuesday, everybody.